Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeline Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, S. Bronza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Fred, Benga Akanabe, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Jill. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu yeah. concert. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. We ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we go up to trade twos. So we trade twos, I was just really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. <laughs>Everybody, welcome to our March Get Lit with All of It book club event with Patricia Lockwood and her novel. No one is talking about this. If you've been coming to our virtual events, we've been doing them for about a past the past year. Welcome back. If you're new to our book club, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Allison Stewart. I host all of it with Allison Stewart on WNYC live weekdays from 12 to 2. And we love books on our show. I always say our show is about music, art, everything. We're kind of culture curious. That's how I put it. Uh, but we do love books. And we've had this book club for a little over the year. And it's been a tremendous amount of fun because not only do we talk to really smart, cool authors, we also, it's kind of more like a book party. And we always have music involved in our shows. And so tonight we are really Really excited because John Darneal of Mountain Goats will be joining us performing a couple of songs. There's a connection between him and Patricia. We'll get to that in a little bit. But and we also want to tell you to stick around to the very end of the event because we're going to announce our April book. And the hint there is Nobel Prize. So stick around for that. But first, here's the big number. 5,319 of you checked out a copy of No One Is Talking About This, courtesy of our partners at the New York Public Library. So let's talk about this book. Patricia Lockwood and the protagonist of No One Is Talking About This have a few, few things in common. Both of these women saw their careers take off when something they posted went viral. Patricia and our protagonist also shared some heartbreaking tragedy, losing a niece before her first birthday due to complications of Proteus syndrome. The two experiences form the backbone of her novel, and we are thrilled to have Patricia Lockwood with us. I'm allowed to call you Trisha though, right? Yes, and that is actually perfect. That is just what I want. Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much for having me and for choosing this book. I don't think, well, maybe I've been chosen for a book club before. I was chosen for a friend's family book club and she told me they were reading my book and then she never said anything about it again. That was for priest studies, so not this one. <laughs> Oh, I want so, to know more about that story. Please yeah, I'm like, there must us. be more. Well, they knew me when I was in high school. So there was definitely a history there. And uh, pro private things were most likely discussed. Yeah, but this is this is a big one. This was very exciting to be chosen for this. 
I usually don't start book club interviews with the most obvious question, but I'm truly, truly curious about the title of the book. Yes. So it, this is sort of, um, it was kind of a little bit of a meme. It's something that people say a lot on Twitter, or as I call it in the book, the portal. There is a lot of times um, a tweet where someone is trying to point our attention to something that in fact, everyone is talking about. Everybody knows what it is and has been saying a lot about it actually. And they'll end the tweet with like, no one is talking about this exclamation right. point. Um, and it's just kind of like a way to point to the importance of what you're talking about. It's in the same vein as things like thread and that sort of thing, that, that kind of convention that we've always seen. But it felt sometimes these conventions or even these memes do have this, this broader meaning, um, this, this sort of profundity, I think. And I felt that in this title. I called it that for a while and then I tried to change it to People on the Sun and we decided that we couldn't do that. It was just too, I think they really wanted me to go with something that the headline could be, everyone is talking about this. So it was absolutely not an option <laughs> that we would change it. Marketing was like, there's no way we're keeping, uh, no one is talking about this. Our narrator, she's always the narrator. Yes. Did she ever have a name? She did actually. And she had a really very specific name. Uh, it was Rachel. Because when I conceptualized the book very specifically, um, we were moving apartments and I was hiding from my husband and making him do all the work. Um, I was reading a book called Mrs. Caliban by Rachel Ingalls. And I sort of just saw the book, the beginning of it, at least at that time. And because I'm not very imaginative, I thought, well, I'm just going to call this lady Rachel for now. <laughs> and I remember actually when I read a long section of it at the British Museum, which is something that also happens in the book at the very end. Uh, when I sent the London Review of Books the script, they were like, who's this woman, Rachel? You left a couple instances of this lady's name, Rachel, in here. And I was like, no, no, take that out. That's, it's just, we're not calling her that anymore. <laughs> Did the other characters have names as well? No, uh, they never did, which I think spoke a little bit to a kind of a self-centered quality to it. You know, mm -hmm. when you go into the portal, you do just become like a, a pure eye, really, um, or, or a pure experience, I think, of, of your own narrative. And you're just flowing down this space. You don't necessarily think about what things or people are called. I did have people say they were like, the husband doesn't have a name. Someone walks into the room. Mm -hmm. That person doesn't have a name. And it's like, yeah, you're, you're just in the portal. That's what you're doing. It's like little ghosts coming in and out of the room when you're doing that thing. Our narrator, how much can we trust our narrator in this book? I think we can trust her quite a bit, actually. I think that she's probably um, unable to lie, maybe in the way that I am unable to lie. So there are things in the book that are fictional, but I as a person, and I envision this for, for my narrator as well, like if you ask me a direct question, I will tell you the absolute truth Catholic hand to God. And I'll even give you a little extra information that probably you didn't even ask for. Like it's it's a really, really bad trait to have. I went into a bar one time with a friend and we uh, had forgotten our IDs and we sat down at the bar and he asked us what we wanted. And I looked at him and I was like, neither of us have our IDs. You cannot serve us. And my friend was like, what, come on. Like you have no chill. What is wrong with you? What is your problem? You so just that's what I'm up. like, I just offered it up. I was like, I do not have my ID and neither does she. Like neither of us can have a drink. So that's, that's kind of the, the person we're talking about here. So there's the book, you know, it's interesting. A friend of mine, I said, you have to read this book. It's really great. And they were reading the first half and they were like, I really love this book. This is great. And then he said to me, the second half. I just got a tweet, that said, a, a, a text that said, the second half. When you were writing the book, how did you think about putting these two, two parts, these two very different parts, but at the same time, they sort of have a similar, I mean, they have the character, the narrator in common, but I, it, they're very different, but they feel right together. I guess I'm asking, yeah. how did you do that? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's a good question. And I think it's because the second half is largely autobiographical, yeah. much more so than the first half. You know, there are definitely things with 
dildos in the first half that aren't true, mom, if you're watching. <laughs> but the second half, uh, that break, I experienced it as a rupture in time, really. Uh, but there was hmm. sort of something I had tuned myself to do when I was writing about the portal, which is uh, that I was observing everything, like the little downy hairs, you know, on, on like the forehead of the internet, really. And I was still doing that, but it was turned to a real life situation. Hmm. Uh, and then it was actually turned to a person who needed my attention and who needed my care, who needed my eye. Um, and I felt like it's maybe what I had been developing that eye for. So I just really began to compulsively write about my niece um, when she was born. And before that, when my sister was pregnant and I told my sister that I was writing about her and I said, I, I can't stop. I feel it as a physical response, something I ought to be doing so that I don't lose any of it. And maybe that's mm. the thing that was animating the first half of the book too, the desire to not lose any of it. I didn't, where does it go if we don't write it down? Why does your protagonist spend so much time in the portal? Aside from the fame, what does she get out of it? This is, this is a good question too. And I think for me and, and some other people who use the portal in this way, I think we get stuck in it. Um, I'm a person who for long periods will experience hyper-focus. Um, I stim a lot. I'll read for periods of 10, 11 hours. Um, there's something that neurodivergent people actually experience, some of them called inertia, which is not just always the um, inability to start something, but the inability to stop something. So if I'm doing something, a lot of times I cannot stop doing it, if that makes any sense. And so I think some people with ADD, um, you know, people people who are on the spectrum, people who have sort of different uh, like cognitive setups, mm -hmm. I think sometimes just find themselves in this place and, and not really leaving it. But that being said, I think it's also set up to, um, to sort of uh, exact this from people who don't have those issues too. So it is being set up to turn us into little rats who are going for the dopamine pellet. Um, all of these apps mm -hmm. are, are pretty much designed in this way. So even if you're not a person like me who you know can read a book for 10 hours and then can read the internet for 10 hours, I, I think that you can end up doing that stuff too because it's been designed that way. I remember interviewing somebody once and they said only Silicon Valley and drug dealers call the people, <laughs> call people users. <laughs> for a reason. It's really true. It's true. And now they're all kind of like looking nervously around like, was mm -hmm. that us? Like, were we the guys who did this? Like, oh, for a while, you know, we were like these guys on, on the, the white horses riding into town to like reinvent buses and stuff like what? You don't want that now? That's not something you want <laughs> right. now, right? Is that no longer a good thing? Um, but yeah, I think I think that's what they were trying to do. It was it was mm -hmm. designed so that we would use this product, you know, as much as possible, like as many hours of, of the day as we could. Early on in the book, the narrator, she even questions why she spends so much time in the portal. And she says, it had something to do, she knew, with child chained up in the yard. Her great grandmother, an imaginary invalid, had kept her firstborn son chained up to a stake in the front yard so she could always see what he was doing through the window. How is that story of abuse and trauma connected? to why she spends so much time in the portal online. So this is this is autobiographical too. Um, mm. I was told that story as a child and there are other things I think that happen in the first book, uh, the first half of the book, her autistic cousin, for instance, that she's still seeing with a child's eyes. Maybe she's not necessarily thinking about them as abuse mm. and she's sort of just presenting them, you know, as, as this story I was told when I was a child that I haven't examined more deeply, but I just always had that image of my uncle Pete who also became a priest which is a very nice little detail um just you know sitting there and he's chained up I think because you know my great grandmother was worried about what what the world meant to him you know what what it, what it could represent to him in terms of danger she wanted to be able to see him at all times but it also meant that he watched the world in a different way mm -hmm. you know if you were sitting on that patch of grass that had been granted to you it meant also that that he learned to watch in a different way let's talk a little bit about your writing style do the fragments come to you fully formed 
Yes, basically, yes. When mm -hmm. they're good, they come to me fully formed. If I find that I'm really, really overworking something, it probably needs to be chucked out. Um, I think it's a lot like poetry, where a good line will arrive in the way that a good joke will. And it's just absolutely like that. It's, it's a physical response. It comes out of your mouth almost whole. Um, and it doesn't seem like it could have been written any other way. So the ones that, that come out that way are usually the ones that stay. And the ones that I'm just like sitting there with that lump of Play-Doh just working it and working it while it gets worse and worse and worse. Those are usually the ones that you have to let them go. You know, you feel that you're pouring your sweat and your blood into those, but it's also like you're also working over them so hard sometimes because they're not working. So just let them go. Just let that ugly thing be. <laughs> What was one that you worked over and you worked over and you just couldn't quite make it work in this particular book? Well, this is funny. No, I don't think this would work in any book. But when I was revising the book, I did have first active coronavirus um, and then like a little bit of a post-COVID period where I was not mentally completely mm. on my game. Um, and I decided in this delirium that I needed to include this anecdote about uh, traveling, the protagonist traveling with her sister to Scotland, where they peed together next to Rob Roy's grave and really nothing else happened. So they're peeing together uh, next to Rob Roy's grave. And, you know, the, the narrator's husband, you know, asks her like why these people came to visit Rob Roy's grave. Like, why did they bring him flowers, lay stones on, on his headstone? Uh, like, what exactly did Rob Roy do? And the narrator's like, he did everything. He did it all. He was Rob Roy. And I thought at the time that that was the most profound thing that anyone had ever come up with. And I, weeks, I worked on this for weeks and I was obsessed with working in the peeing next to Rob Roy's grave thing. And then I was like, oh wait, I have coronavirus. So let's not, we're just not going to ever talk about that again. There are a couple things in there. Actually, there are like two more coronavirus things that are in the book and mm -hmm. only I will ever know what they are. And I'll take it to my grave with me, to my Rob Roy grave. Fair. You shared the Rob Roy. I will not yeah. go farther. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, as a poet, you you love words, and little, even the, with the fragments, not even with the fragments, are beautifully put together. And clearly, you've worked on them, and they even if they've come to you perfectly formed, you've figured out what order they should be in, and what rhythm they should mm -hmm. be in, or who mm -hmm. with what they should be paired with. Um, but it's interesting about words and language. We uh, it says on page sixty three, why are we all writing like this now? because a new kind of connection has to be made and blink, synapse, little space between was the only way to make it or because, and this was more frightening, it was the way the portal wrote. And then on page 70, was it better to resist the new language where it was stole, defanged, co-opted, consumed, or was it better to text Thanksgiving titties be popping to all your friends <laughs> on the fourth Thursday of November? So what was it that you wanted to explore about language? It's, and it's so interesting after hearing you describe really having to work and massage these fragments and then to think about the way you, you write about and your narrator thinks about language. I think that, I think people talk about Twitter, about the portal as, as like a jumble of, of, of meaningless fragments thrown together. Um, but I think we experience tremendous meaning in the portal. And I think that the meaning comes through that contrast, that juxtaposition. I think we are experiencing a narrative in there that is supplied by the way those, those fragments lie against mm. each other. I think it's different for every other person and it's different every time, but it is a narrative. It is some kind of meaning. And I knew all the way back like to when I started that of course I wanted to write about the language that is what we have been doing there that's what we were doing there at the very beginning when Twitter was good in 2011 in those days where it seemed like we were building mm -hmm. something something together and it was absolutely collaborative and if we were starting to sound a bit like each other it was in a, in a, a way like we were a collective like we were some sort of comedy team who was all working in tandem and I liked that a lot because I think that's how language happens and I think it's how new language happens and I think at the beginning of all new language there's people talking about how crappy it is basically right or how it isn't it, it, it isn't real it's not the stuff that you can write books out of you know that it's it's not as good as what we had before and I think 
it is always as good as what we had before because it's what we use to speak to each other. Mm -hmm. So I wanted even in the second half of the book to show that she still thinks in that language, that she even like talks to the baby in that language, that she wants to read the baby Wikipedia. Um, All of these things that make up the new fabric of her life, those things are real. It is a real language and she can use it to talk to people. And I want to remind our viewers that you can put your questions in for Patricia. So we'll get to them in about the next five, 10 minutes. Uh, We do, we hold our book club in the weeks prior to this live event on Instagram. And we are always putting up questions and having discussions. So we asked our listeners whether they thought the protagonist should quit the portal entirely. (laughs) 69% said yes. 31% said no. So 69% said, yes, it's the perfect internet number. You couldn't have engineered it more beautifully. It's the sex number. I can't even believe how good that is. I mean, yeah, she should probably leave, right? It is this very funny thing where people are like, do you have the same relationship with Twitter as you previously did? And it's like, no, I don't think anyone has the same relationship with Twitter that they previously did. But I am you know, there now because I'm talking about a book that I've released and it's kind of a thing you have to do. Um, so yeah, I think the 69 69% are probably right on the money. I would like to hear more from that 31% because they might be even more online than me. Let's talk about the second half of the book when we see the protagonist with her sister who's learned that the child is grow, has this condition known as Proteus syndrome, which your niece has. Uh, proteussyndrome.org describes it this way. Proteus syndrome is a condition which involves atypical growth of the bones, skin, and head, and can lead to a variety of other symptoms. The condition is caused by a genetic mutation in AKT1, an important gene that helps to regulate the growth of cells. In this book, this is based on your real niece, Lena, and you write about her. This is for Lena, who was a bell. Yes. Why was that a good description of Lena? So uh, her name is pronounced Lena. She's my, Lena, I'm sorry. My Lena. beautiful girl. No, you're perfect. And it is because uh, there was a moment where my sister and I discovered that she responded to music when she was in utero. Mm. And the first time it ever happened was the, it was like the, the Negulesco overture for the, um, for the movie How to Marry a Millionaire. And she started really responding to the horns. And I thought, well, there's really something to that. So I started playing her all this old... Um, musicals uh, soundtracks <laughs> and she loved the song um, if I were a bell from guys and dolls she uh. responded to it she would cycle her legs she would pump her arms and she was experiencing sheer complete sensory excitement the the only way she could experience those things uh, that, that that kind of feeling mm-hmm. is if you brought them to her she wasn't going to you know just start hearing a song out of nowhere on her own we realized at some point that we had to bring her these things like flowers that we had to show them to her uh lay them in her lap really uh and show her the things of the world so yeah and that to me, that pure responsiveness, it was not just about the song, but it was about her, that she was a bell just swinging back and forth and ringing and ringing. You write about Lena. Lena? Lena. Lena. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're fine. You, you write about Lena in the acknowledgments. You were not here to teach us, but we did learn. What did you learn? I mean, everything. There was. I write in the book that it was something like the feeling of travel, that you were put back in your body again, that you were the, mm-hmm. the slap of your souls on the pavement, uh, pavement and you were you know, the palms of your hands, that you were your eyes experiencing these new sights. So you were interpreting the world for her. So you were seeing all those things again. You were seeing the meaning of them and you were thinking about what they meant to you. Um, again, she was, she was like a flower. She was something that, that that needed air and needed water and and needed love. And you represented those things. And the education was just bringing them to her. And Mm -hmm. and so you would see them yourself again for the first time. We asked our readers if they had heard of Proteus syndrome before this novel. 86% said they had not heard of it. So for many people, this was an introduction. Mm -hmm. Was that on your mind? and on your radar as you were writing this part of the book? 
Very much so. And I think that that was the reason too, that a lot of that was so factual because I'm not going mm. to make up something, you know, about a, a real syndrome that exists that, that people live with. Um, but yeah, so we experienced like a, a tremendous real world education about it. And then there, there of course are real world organizations like the Proteus Foundation who really taught us things. And there is a conference that people go to, you know, most mm -hmm. of the people who are living with Proteus are, are kids and teenagers. And when they can, and it's not a pandemic, you know, they get together, they meet each other, you know, they take pictures together. And that's something we would have wanted for Lena, you know, and my mm -hmm. sister got to go um, after Lena passed. And mm -hmm. it was very, very meaningful for her. It has been very meaningful to turn people to the organization, um, to, to talk about my specific niece and say that, you know, this is the work that the Proteus Foundation has been doing. And, you know, like maybe like throw a dollar their way if you mm -hmm. enjoyed this or if you felt like this was something that spoke to you because I, I think you know it's it's like how else do you get the word out I think most people's point of reference has been the movie The Elephant Man mm -hmm. uh, because they they believe that he may have suffered uh, from Proteus syndrome. It was beautiful to hear you describe wanting to take your niece out into the world and, and, the, and the protagonist does as well. They want to take the child out and have her experience the world, but they start to realize, the narrator starts to realize the world can be a scary place because yeah. people can be horrible. Um, in the book, it says a teenager on the nighttime ferry snuck his phone over her shoulder to take a picture of the baby in her special stroller. Though by that time it seemed baffling, she didn't look that different from other babies, did she? He was taking pictures because of her sweetness, her freshness, not because he was going to post them, right? Is the internet frightening? Is the portal frightening for your narrator now as someone who got so much from it and was so devoted to it? Maybe in that way, possibly in that moment, but I think what the narrator is experiencing and what I experienced myself was sheer bafflement again, mm -hmm. because when you speak in terms of education, there is also something that is the education of the eye. When a doctor tells mm -hmm. you about a syndrome, when your doctor says, you know, this is what Proteus syndrome is, don't look it up. What right. they mean is that you'll, you know, go to Google images and that you will potentially experience a moment of shock because you're registering something that is not what you expect. But when you are talking about individuals, when you're talking about people you know, when you're talking about your own niece, the eye is educated. She is herself. That is how she looks. She is beautiful. And I think it's so important later that what the narrator realizes too is that it, it wouldn't fright her. It wouldn't frighten her. Um, you know, after the child is gone to put her picture in the portal, because then people would see her, that that is mm. a sort of continuance of her. And that in fact, what she wanted at that time just was for people to see her. So no, I think that she isn't frightened. I think that again, she sees the portal as a place where people could meet that child. What do you think is the biggest piece of knowledge that the narrator learns in the second half of the book? Uh, I think it is just there's a moment where the narrator, her husband is calling to tell her about a news story about people, um, you know, enemies shooting a word into someone's brain through radio waves. And she's like, oh my God, like, can they do it with any word? And he's like, yeah, any word. And she's like, maybe something like that is what happened to me that someone just shot the word love into my heart that it is just that word, this, 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 not even just her name, but just the word love, love, love. And I thought actually of, of John, um, who is going to play for us, you know, the, he, he has, he has that song. I sang some of his songs to Lena. There are these things, you know, like I, I knew John in the portal. Um, I knew his music separately from that. And that's something that I brought to her, you know? I have to bring up humor. This yeah. is a hard, let me take a hard right <laughs> here, uh, because there are, you know, it, it's a thoughtful book. It's an emotional book. I got emotional reading that one passage, but it's also like snort funny yeah. in parts snort. of the book. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Truly <laughs> snort funny. Um, do you have to craft the laughs as well? Or, or you are naturally a funny person. 
I think probably it's a little bit natural. Yeah. And it's yeah. almost too fast, actually. You're like, do you really think about what you say before it comes out of your mouth? <laughs> like, if it doesn't come out on the split second almost instantaneously, there's a part of pre study where I talk about this with my mom and I tell her that it's like pun lightning, which is what strikes my mom. And she suddenly has the perfect pun for a situation. It happens that fast. It's just like this physical thing, a split second thing. Um, and I think that that's even harder to craft. You can work poetry into a line, but I don't think that you can really work the laugh in that way. Patricia, Trisha, Trisha, <laughs> are you ready for some audience questions? I am ready for audience questions, yes. All right, this is from Catherine. Hi. Hi Catherine. I was surprised the dog twins comment went viral. Do you have theories about why? Thank you. <laughs> so your narrator, this is the tweet, it goes viral. Yeah, I like that question because it's a little bit of like, I don't buy that that went viral. Um, so yeah, that's actually never anything that I tweeted. I needed something that was plausibly a tweet that could go big. And tweets that go big are sometimes things that almost don't mean anything. So I was like, it needs to almost mean nothing, but have that special ring to it. Uh, and of course, one of the real jokes of the book is that she becomes famous just on the basis of this single <laughs> tweet. You know, it's like she's traveling the world. She's going to Australia simply because of Canada. Dog between uh, be twins. I don't know if in real life, if I had tweeted it, if it would have gone viral in the same way as say Miet tweet because it did not have a cat pic attached to it or something mm -hmm. like that. But I mean, that's for the future to decide really. We were the ones who were there. You might know, perhaps that you know that it rings false, but maybe people, mm -hmm. people of the future might not. Were you surprised when your piece rape joke, this one's acclaimed poem essay if anybody hasn't read it you should read it were you surprised when it went viral I don't really know that I had an idea that poems could go viral then this was sort of before you know there's like a time of like Instagram and Twitter virality mm -hmm. for this kind of thing um it might have been one of the earlier examples of that so no I had not thought about that at all. Um, it was very overwhelming. And it was also when I was living with my parents in the period depicted in pre-study. So mm. I think if, you know, if it hadn't been in a situation where I already had a lot else to deal with, that I probably would have been very laser focused on the situation. But as it was, I was like, you know what, I gotta, you know, go on a road trip with my mom now. So it's fine. But no, I, I, I did not expect it at all. Um, yeah, and it was really my first experience with that, that sort of, not fame, but just something being ever present. Or now when I'm introduced, um, you know, at festivals and conferences and things like I'll be introduced that way, which always throws you out of it a little bit because you think, oh, yeah, that is how people know me. Nancy asks, how do you feel about the monetization of personal information on the Internet? Yeah, I would say that that's something that we weren't seeing as much in those days I speak about as mm -hmm. being the good days. I mean, way back when, when you started out as a blogger, uh, you remember when like the first bloggers put ads on their blogs and that was this very controversial um, mm -hmm. decision. It was like, what is what the mommy bloggers are doing? Is that okay? Um, but it may just be something to do with the vehicle. I mean, I have written a book about my niece. I've written a book about my family. So that's also a, mm -hmm. a form of monetization. You can say that something is a higher art than another thing, but yeah, it may just be a different vector. This is from Instagram. What about Ken? Uh, hi, hi, Patricia. Love the book. Just wanted to ask, what has your online routine been since you fish, finished the book? And do you look at your time spent differently now? I think that I do. Um, you would you would think maybe that quarantine would be the perfect time for me to absolutely make the final dive into my phone where I never come out on the other side. And they're like, where did she go? There's just a little grease spot on the ground here. Where's Trisha? Uh, <laughs> but no, because I got COVID, I didn't. I was like, wait a minute. Whoa, I don't want to be here. That's not something I want to be doing. Um, and it was already starting to be true, you know, after after my niece passed away. And you do see, you know, it sounds like corny or it's, you know, it's very overused language, but you do see that certain things are more important that, you know, this it is important to be in your body sometimes doing the necessary and the crucial things. But for me, in terms of, you know, the daily routine of the internet, the only thing is that I just can't look at Twitter first thing. 
Um, especially so I would say when Trump was in office, but like even now you can't look at it first thing because it, it takes over your brain for the day. It sets the topics Mm -hmm. and that's what you're going to be thinking about. And it's going to be a thing where it's like, do I have to, I was like trying to figure out today who Chet Hanks was. And I was like, you know, (laughs) climbing backward through the, and I'm like, who is this guy? Does he even look like Tom Hanks? What's going on with him? What's a white boy summer? I don't understand any of this. So I think that sometimes people just stay in the portal because because like, if you're out too long, you miss that stuff. And then you have to scramble for information when you sign back in. But if you go on first thing, that's your brain for the day. It's done. Caitlin asks, did anything personal inspire the first half of the book, the fame, the notoriety from your experience, or was it just meant to satirize our current moment? So no, a lot of that was autobiographical as well, particularly the travel items. Rob Roy might not have made it in, but many (laughs) other um, travel things that came about because of um, Priest Daddy and my other writing, a lot of those were real, uh, travels around the world and things like that. Um, And there are as well family elements that that are autobiographical. It's really just more, I don't know, so you're you're sort of... uh, she's kind of this dispersed personality, right? She's not just mm-hmm. herself. She is other people. She's other people's viewpoints. She's like whole arguments that sets of people are having. So it's not just about like a singularity. It's not just about a single person. In that sense, it can't be entirely autobiographical because it's something that we all created together. It's, it's all of us forming this personality. This is Rachel. Rachel. Coming from another, from the, from the narrator coming, channeling in through a question. Um, what is a question about the book that you haven't been asked yet you would like to be? Honestly, my brain is so wet. I've done like 50 interviews at this point. And if there is a question out there that hasn't been asked about the book, I do not know what it is. Um, so sadly, no, if I think of one later, I'll post it on Twitter. But I, I do feel like, and the questions have been really good. I feel like the conversations I've had about the book have been very good. But yeah, I don't like to borrow trouble and think of questions mm-hmm. that people can ask me later that I <laughs> myself suggested. So <laughs> have have. Has it been hard at all to talk about your niece? No, that has been wonderful, I think. It was the fact that the promotional push started like right around uh, January 6th. So I was talking about all of this at basically the most stressful, um, uh, like hair falling out Mm. time that you could possibly think of. But there was, you know, a moment in the first couple of interviews um, where I was kind of feeling out my way. And like I told you before, I pathologically tell the truth. And I thought I can't maintain some fiction where I don't say which things are true or which things really happened. I wanted to talk about what really happened. Um, I did an interview with the New York Times and we just got so stuck. We were just looking at each other, uh, trying to have this real conversation. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards I emailed her and I was like, I think that I just the whole time like wanted to show you her picture because if we had been together in real life in a park or something or like getting Mm -hmm. drinks, I would have just showed you my phone and I would have showed you her picture on my phone. And Mm -hmm. so I was able to to break through after that, I think, because I think that is what I really wanted. I really wanted to talk about her. That hasn't been hard at all. What's next for you? What are you working on? It's funny. I did in these early um, uh, insurrection interviews, I like lightly mentioned that I was working on some short stories and then it came out in all of these uh, like pieces about me that I was working on a collection of short stories. <laughs> so... <laughs> Was there something that you'd like to read about yourself? We can just throw it out there now. I was like, you know what? I guess I am committed to write a collection of short stories now. And all of us are going to get to read that in four years, something like that. But it it might be true. It might be true. We'll see. So Patricia, we're going to ask you to stick around. Yes. For our musical guest, because as I, as you, if you know about our book club, we try to have our musical guests and our book sort of intertwine and mix it So with John Darnielle of Mountain Goats, you actually tweeted about him. We're going to stay on the whole tweet portal thing. You tweeted on September 10th, 2015 at 1.05 a.m. What were you doing at 1.05 a.m.? I was drunk is what I was. (laughs) (laughs) But you tweeted, most people will tell you that music is bad. But tonight, the way the Mountain Goats played it, it's not. I John met Dar- you that night. John Gurney, you look at Mountain Goats. Welcome. Yeah, hey, how's it going? That's an amazing 
I'm, I'm a huge fan of this book and of her work. That's that's incredibly moving for me. That's awesome. No, that that night in 2015 was after that concert that you gave in Lawrence, Kansas. The solo show, right? It was just me. Yes, right? it was yeah, just yeah. you. Um, you played Way Down in the Mine. You played Werewolf Gimmick. Uh, you played a bunch of stuff, and we talked afterwards. Um, yeah, yeah, we hung out on. It was on the college campus, right? Yes, the, absolutely. It was a big. It was a huge. These solo shows sometimes they'll book you in a very August sort of room, yes. you know. <laughs> And then other times, like, I think the night before I'd been in like St. Louis in, in, in a rock club, it's, it's kind of disorienting, but that was like huge glass walls and stuff. And I'm never going to feel like I belong in a room like that. Yes, no, guess. but it was incredible. No. It was yeah, incredible. That was, that was, that was, those were fun shows. I think Heather McIntyre was opening for yes, me. Yes, she was. Yeah. And she's a, an impossibly talented, amazing performer, uh, like yourself, hard act to follow. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's also very inspiring to tour with somebody who like you go, well, you better do something good. Heather yeah. just played. Yeah, so. yeah, but it was fabulous. And I think I was supposed to be interviewing you for like the local paper, but probably at that point you had done like a ton of interviews. So we yeah. didn't finish it. And part of your stage banter that night was like, man, when you're doing these interviews and someone asks you a question like this and I'm like chilled to the bone in my seat. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> he's talking about my interview. Well, it was, so she just asked you, is there anything you want to be asked? And you said you did like 55 and like, you know, when people ask me that, when I'm like, I'd like to be asked if I'd like to go. If yeah, I'd like to right. go. Get would you like to go to the bathroom? Would, would you a, like a sandwich, John? If you asked me that, I would say, thank you. <laughs> yes, I'd like to go rest now. <laughs> I think it was something about, um, you know, like a process or like inspiration or something like that. And, and yeah. I think you made the, I put on my robe and wizard uh, hat um, <laughs> joke. That's like, how do you write your song? Something like that. I put on my robe and wizard hat. But yeah, in, in these interviews, I am asking like, and I'm answering a lot of times, you know, like how I do this, which is a very like, well, yeah, I put on my robe and wizard hat. You know, it's funny. I have come to, to, enjoy that question more than I used to. Because mm -hmm. I now, I think there's a lot of defensiveness when I was younger about what's your process. Like, well, I don't actually know. That, yeah, that's why right. I can't answer that. It's because I don't baby. know. Yeah. And also because I don't want to break it down. I don't like to look in mirrors. I don't like, you know, I'm not a hater of other people's selfies, but as for me, I do not, <laughs> I don't want to self-regard. I want to be right. in process. Right. And so right. I don't like to sit back and go, what did I do and was it good or not? I just sort of want to be in flow. You know, that's my style. And then later, you know, later I can look at it, but but now I'm a little more open to the idea of well, what do I actually do? Do I have any routines that might be useful? I, I like yeah. the idea of being useful with answers that 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 makes interviews funner, more funner. That's a fun. It's I'm, more funner. It's awesome. way more I'm funner saying. to be useful. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Like, I, I think, think if, somebody got some use out of it. That makes me yeah. feel like my day was good. So. Yeah. I think if you think about it that way, that's, that's been a better way, but yeah, you do. I think that there's something about like, if you enjoy like existing in the mystery, then you can get almost like a little bit prickly sometimes with some of these yeah. questions, which feel very like personal, like, like they're trying to see something very nude about you, you know, that even you necessarily yeah. don't want to look at really. Yeah. Well, and then often so, like, I mean, I, I don't keep an account, but like when the question is verbatim, what's your creative process like? It's like, well, it's like I wake up and then there's a whole bunch of stuff happens. And then yeah. somewhere in there, maybe I catch this wave, you know, catch uh, wave, but other yeah. times, but other times I know I have to do something. So I just, I mean, it's like, it's, it's too vague a question. It's like asking somebody, how do you kiss? You know, yeah. well, you, well, I've never figured it out really. So it's not, <laughs> but no, my process I don't is like- now because I have a beard. The so. beard. Oh, it's beautiful though. It's like point, it's, okay. it's getting kind of satanic. What do you think? Is it getting a little it's, bit satanic? Yeah, I could, I mean, everybody, Serge Tankian is the guy they say I look like, and I happen to really like that guy. So I'm not into that. Great. But there's also some like evil looking Dutch portrait of some dude from the oh, 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, Completely. So, <laughs> who I now look exactly like. And the guy looks like, oh, this is a guy with some skeletons, you know, not even in his basement, just on his kitchen floor. <laughs> so, I went to an amazing- I have a question. Oh yeah, go. Yes. I have a question. <laughs> Sorry. I'm enjoying this tremendously. And now I know what questions not to ask. <laughs> um, John, tell yes. me, is there something that you wanted to ask Patricia about this beautiful book? Um. You know, this is a dumb question, but uh, but I'm curious because I think everybody who reads this book, and I, you know, not to not to not to flatter you on camera and stuff, but like this is a book that as you're reading it, it's one of those books that for for husbands, this is this is a, a terrible book to give to a husband because the husband, like me, will then start to read every other page out loud, and his poor long suffering wife, oh. 
He's reading one of those books that he has to read the whole damn thing out loud. <laughs> so books. Oh, oh, yeah. It's very much one of those. Like, oh my God, listen to this. So, but here's the thing is like, it's very much a call and response book. There's the first half, which is largely riotously funny. And even when it's, even when it's like, you know, shocking and, you know, makes you interrogate whether you're living your life right. There's actually a, a religious a tract that's one of my favorites called How Then Shall We Live? How Then right? Shall We Live? Yes, and that's very the much first so. half of this book is How Then Shall We Live? We do live mm -hmm. like this and are we living wrong? Right? It's a bit the question you pose. And the second half largely says, well, yes, largely we are, but there are also blessings in that 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 play out in desperate circumstances, right? That we wouldn't be able to find a pathway through as, you know, that we'd be missing out on some blessings. Uh, but which part of the book do you like better? I know it's a brutal question, but but like, do you have a part where you go that you feel prouder of, right? Where you go there, that's what I do. That's what I'm good at. Where you feel a little swagger, you know, is it in the first half or the second half? I feel like I, I do feel proud of the first half. And sometimes when people have been asking me things in interviews and they read part, I'll like laugh out loud and be like, ha ha, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> but the second half, to me is my life everything is there and i feel that she is there she is intact yeah. there so it's not even a question of having it be my favorite i feel like she is just alive there when i go so back true. into that part and sometimes yeah. i read it over and i'm like you failed you didn't get in everything there are things that you didn't get in and then i speak to people and they're like i see her you know mm -hmm. i know what her personality is like i was speaking to my mother after she read the excerpt in the New Yorker, which is uh, from the second half. And she said, I remember everything and it's just what it was like. And there was only one thing that you missed, which is that you would, how we missed her breathing after she was gone. You could always hear her breathing everywhere in the house. She had trachea malacia, which is a floppy airway. Mm -hmm. So you could always hear her and you always knew where she was. And then it was gone. But sometimes if you went into a room really fast, it was like you would still hear it. You would still hear it somewhere up near the ceiling and all of us had it and I couldn't work it in. And maybe that is just something that is personal for us, but yeah. Yeah, but you did so much work in that second half, uh, which I think, I mean, the, the thing is when I saw the second half was not gonna be full of laughs. There was part of me that's like, I mean, oh. this first half was really strong stuff. I said, right. you're gonna go <laughs> take this turn, I hope, you know, but, but then it gets so deep and so good. And I think that's one of the things you actually do really well is that after she dies, um, absence is what defines death. Like the moment of death actually is often quite, you know, you're, even though you're not ready for it, it, it leaves this emptiness that you didn't know how to describe until it comes into existence, right? And so it's the absence that really is where the grief lies, right? Yeah. It's like the, the shock of the moment that you predict, it, it, it's almost, it takes so long to parse that, but it's the empty space, you know, left that's, that's hardest. And you really do a, a, an amazing job of, of sketching the outline of that space. It's such Thank a good you. book. I really admire it so deeply. It's, a, it's an accomplishment. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. Tricia, thank you so much for being thank our you, author Allison. this month. We had such amazing response from our listeners. It was, I was, I'm getting choked up again. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very moving story. Your story is very moving and I really appreciate all of your candor and your good spirit tonight. And thank you so much for having me and break a freaking leg, JD. Thank you very much. <laughs> So John, we're gonna play one of your songs first. The song that right. was inspired, not by one of Patricia's tweets, by a different tweet. Let's <laughs> talk about it on the other side. This is Picture of My Dress. Here at a truck stop in New Mexico. Just before dawn, somebody's grandma behind the wheel of a big rig, pulling in with her headlights on. We smoke a cigarette as the sunrise runs riot. Someone's got to pray the quiet. She says, What are you doing here anyway? And I smile and say, You'd never get. She holds it up for me by its skinny white shoulder straps. Well, I I take a picture of my dress. I take a picture of my dress. 
I'm here in the bathroom. Of a Dallas, Texas Burger King And Mr. Steven Tyler He's on the overhead speakers And he doesn't want to miss a thing Back there at the counter Blending in with the lunchtime crowd Try not to laugh out loud I eat half my crispy chicken club I get extra mayonnaise, it's a mess I take the other half back To the parking lot with me Pop the trunk And take a picture of my dress I take a picture of my dress It still looks good I only wore it once. Nine years ago. Nine years and seven months. It may be a long time before the highway relents and finally sets me free. I'm gonna have to chase down the remnants. Something special that you stole from me It may be hiding in the sunset Or in distant corners of the dawn Maybe it's gone But I say some prayers above the engine I bless everything there is to bless Run out of gas in the middle of nowhere anyway by the roadside Smiling I take a picture of my dress I take a picture of my dress I take a picture of my John Darnell of Mountain Goats is still with us. So we were actually just having a great, a great conversation about what we like to read. Yeah. You, you show our readers what you, what you're, our viewers, what you're, you're into. This right is now. my new find is Elio Peterini, and this is a, a I went on um, a Libris, I think. It's an early New Directions hardback, not that early, uh, but but fifties. Um, but look at the the Directions series. So there's this mm -hmm. list of other books in the series, and I'm totally addicted to that. Like, oh, what else is there? I could have all of them if I wanted to collect them. I'm a bad collector, but still, half of them are by people I've never heard of, and then the others are by like Sartre, Kenneth Rexroth, Raymond Cano, Boris Pasternak, but also, um, you know, Giuseppe Berto, a book called The Works of God. Now, this was good enough for New Directions in 51, so I bet it's an interesting book. You know, that's, that's my, I'm a huge book junkie as far as like, I like to know about the little byways of, of books and sub imprints and stuff like that. That's, that's sort of my zone. How have you been, how have you been dealing with your, how have you been getting your fix during COVID when, I mean, going through bookstores is one of the great pleasures of life. <laughs> Well, yeah, and especially I, I live on tour, so so I, I can tell you where I go to Detroit. I go to John King Books. I've never been to John King, but like you know, I go to Portland and I go to Powell's, the place I've been going to since the '80s. Everybody knows about Powell's, but then like last time I was in Vancouver, uh, can't, uh, BC, I, I found like three bookstores on one walk, and they were all so good, you know. And this is what I do. I mean, all these the books behind you, the shelves behind you, and that's a bunch of mine. But these are things I pick up around the world. Um, but now I, I, you know, I order from my local, from the regulator, mm -hmm. and I encourage everybody to do this, is like support whoever your bookstore that you want to see around when we're going to stores again. Um, but I do also uh, uh, an online thing called Alibris that, that mm -hmm. is a, it's, it connects with used bookstores, right? And, uh, and, and you can find anything on there in all kinds of conditions. And that's where I got that. I read Vitorini. I was like, well, I'm going to need the rest of these guys' books. So, yeah. so I got them. And then they were probably like, there's a good chance that I don't actually read that for another five years or maybe ever, okay. but, but there's a, an essay by, um, God, who is, I, I want to say it's Garcia Marquez. But I'm not sure about how it's not about whether you read the books. It's that when you have books, they all represent possible versions of yourself. 
you know, mm-hmm. like there's the, there's the me who, who's reading that one and now knows something about that, you know, and especially with nonfiction books, I never even finish them. I'm a, I'm a fiction guy, you know, but uh, but I have all these nonfiction books. I think, oh, yeah, maybe someday I will be able to tell you something about that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think if you go into someone's house and there are no books, you just should leave. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, it's got to go. <laughs> I don't believe in deal breakers, but like, as far as like people talk, and I think, well, you know, look, people who aren't at all like you also have something to share, but if you do go into a house, there's no books. That's a weird vibe. <laughs> Completely. You know, we were talking to Trisha earlier and I know uh, before the whole event started, we were all talking a little bit, or you guys were talking and I was eavesdropping and talking about the internet when, and Twitter, when it was a place you'd want to be. A place maybe you'd want to check first thing in the morning as opposed to knowing that you shouldn't for your mental health. Yeah. You know, and I'm curious because because you've been a musician for a long time. How, when you think about the internet and you think about its impact on music and on your livelihood, yeah. what's been positive, what's been negative? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I met my wife on a mailing list, you know, back in the, <laughs> in the, in the days of mailing lists. So uh so and that was before that was like right before what i think was called the the eternal september do you know this term i don't tell me so in the first years of the internet um of usenet right and mailing lists every september the discussions that you'd been having all summer that were kind of great would just go to hell and it would be because a bunch of people had gone to college right and they would arrive to the discussion going i got this one I know this one, right? And and pick fights and get in fights and didn't know how uh-huh. to sort of be in the flow, right? And and that was every September. And then, then suddenly all the colleges were online and the whole discourse became the eternal September. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, where it's like, now, now it's just going to be like this all the time. The number of people buying in every month is so huge. It'll never get back to this. But the thing is, that's an elitist position. And I don't believe in that position, but it's a gatekeeping elitist mm-hmm. position. And, and, and this is similar to like, it does feel like Twitter was at one point, a point where there was a cool kids club doing a cool thing, but I'm very suspicious of any claims that the scene was once cool and now it's not, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it's sort of like, there, there's a line in, in ecclesiastical thinking that like, you know, if you wanna find a perfect church, go join it, but understand that as soon as you join it, you it. it's no longer a perfect church, right? And, uh, and that's the, you know, this thing is like, yeah, it was Twitter was a little cooler when when there was less stuff going around, but at the same time, like as a tool for for broadening knowledge of social justice and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it's done over the past couple of years way more good than it was doing when it was some of us making some really funny jokes that didn't get ripped off by people for their Instagrams and stuff. You know, it's now if you make a good joke, you have to just love a copyright notice on it. <laughs> so and that's depressing, you know. Because the older Twitter crew would never have bit one another's jokes, and now it's like there's there's whole industry of stealing content, you know. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I think the social justice aspect of it and the raising awareness, you know, the a- anti-racism work, uh, anti, mm-hmm. you know, pro-union work, all that kind of so organ- organizing on Twitter, raising of consciousness. Even though you know there's aspects of that where you know people, you know, sending a bunch of people after somebody would, before everything's known. That, that, that can result in things where, you, where mm-hmm. everybody at the end goes, well, none of us were at our best there, really. <laughs> so, but at the same time, you know, when, when videos of police violence go viral mm-hmm. and, and it results in accountability or, or theoretically in some justice, we hope, you know, that's a huge positive and it's for sure worth trading the cool times we had for, you know. Right. Uh, so, that, so I always try to think about that. Um, I'm always, you know, because I come from music scenes and music scenes all go through this period of Eden where it's like, this scene is the coolest and you always know, and it won't be the coolest. Somebody, a couple people are going to find it. It won't be as cool as it was, but that's okay because maybe those people will start bands that are great. Even if the scene sort mm-hmm. of suffers, you know, that's sort of, that's the flow. I sound like a hippie. I'm a hippie. <laughs> it's all right. We're pro hippie around here. Uh, so you put out two albums in 2020. Yes. And they sound completely different. Yes. <laughs> One was recorded on a boom box and the others with the full band. Uh, how did it feel to kind of go back to the sort of origins, sort of like stripped down, boom box, just you? It was a lot of fun. It was, you know, we were talking uh, in the previous segment about self-consciousness. And that's like, that's one reason I don't like to do anything that's sort of already 
it has a backstory if I can help it. You know, it's like, so, so going back to the boom box sort of, there's a point of comparison there. I'm mm. older and I'm a better songwriter now, but that comes at the expense of the immediacy of these, you know, those early recordings. When you hear me, do you play music? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Okay, so you know what the four is, going from the tonic to the four? Mm -hmm. Yep. In those, in those early recordings, when I go to the four, I have I have Columbus syndrome. I'm like, look what I discovered. I <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I am the first person alive to play this G after a D. Am I amazing or what? You know, And that was my vibe. Then every time I would go to the four, I feel like I found God, you know? Well, I mean, oh, I God. still feel that way about the four, but it's not that feeling of like, what have I done? I can do it too. I can play this thing, you know? And so, so sooner or later, once you, once you, you trade, you trade the joy of your own personal mm -hmm. discovery for expertise. And that's, that's a common story, right? And it's a story that it's why a lot of bands first albums are the best ones because that's when everybody mm -hmm. can't believe they're doing the thing, you know? Uh, but, uh, but so that's one reason I didn't go back for a long time, but when we got home from recording and it was clear to me that we wouldn't be going out, and we plan i mean this is our day job right i, I there, there's seven of us who draw a paycheck from this and i feel a profound sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to them i'm i'm you know i'm i don't like the not the boss but i'm i'm the i'm the masthead i'm, I'm, the, I'm mm -hmm. the, the face at the front of the ship you know uh, for better or worse <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, and so i felt like you know i gotta do something that gets us a little bit of money you know, before we go back out on the road in three months, that was my thinking. Right? So, so, um, <laughs> well, well, it didn't did work out that way, but, but, uh, but so I want you to, I realized I didn't say the names of the albums. Will you say them for our, our viewers? So, oh yeah. So the, right now I want to, I want to hear these. What are they? The one that we were recording, uh, mm -hmm. before we came home was called getting into knives. Um, although at the time it was called as many candles as possible. And then it turned out that Jane Stiberry, had an album called All the Candles in the World. And I was like, okay, well, I can't call it that then. Even though I, I kept the song title, but I was like, so I, then I named it for Getting Into Knives, which it turned it to me as a much better album title anyway. So it's a mm -hmm. fortuitous accent there. Um, but, uh, uh, but so yeah, so when I got home, uh, I got out my old boom box. For people who don't know my work uh, or our work, but the Mountain Goats began when I lived in employee housing at Metropolitan State Hospital. And I was, uh, I had a, a big, court case to pay off but i was still making a decent living for the first time in my life and i didn't have a tv uh, uh it was not a decent living to buy a tv but it was decent to buy a boom box so i started just recording these I, I wrote poetry at the time i started setting my poems to very simple chord progressions and singing them out loud and uh and i discovered the immediacy of recording the boom box and the sound of the tape was really pleasing to me and that's how over time that snowballs into it becoming my job there are people for whom those early recordings have a charm and a depth and a power that can't really be matched once it becomes a more uh, complex, a more tailored sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. they're all, those are all recorded within seconds of having been written or they're recorded during the writing, right? It's like, I got an idea, most of it's there, maybe I'll ad lib the last line, you know, and, uh, and you know, I was really into, that was also the days, the, the golden days of lyricism and, and, and rap was fairly new. We were buying 12 inch singles. I was transcribing. This was the nerdiest thing you're ever gonna hear about. I was like, <laughs> I would buy an NWA or an Eric B and Rakim 12 inch and transcribe with my typewriter the lyrics to see how they were doing. Cause for poets, that was the time, man. I was like, those were very, yeah. those were writers, you know, really, you know, and, and it, was, it was incredibly inspiring to me cause I wanted to study poetry in college. And it's like, to me, these guys were playing with the sorts of rhythms that I was interested in with, you know, long 14 beat lines and stuff. And so I'd transcribe those and I would try to write my own poems and then set them these simple tunes, right? And, uh, and then that went away over time. We became a band, we started working in studios. And then when I got home, I had an idea for a new album. There was no reason to really do anything but get started on it. So I started tracking to the boombox and I wrote one on a Monday and then the next day I wrote another one. And I thought, well, and this is how my brain works. I thought, well, what if I just keep doing this until I have 10? I'll do one a day. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, so, it's orderly. It's like, if you're in the zone, you can do that. You know, it's like, I, I do think for me, not for everybody maybe, but for me, the more I work, the more I'm liable to work well. Mm. Eventually it takes a pretty heavy toll on my mental health and on other people's ability to tolerate me, right? Because you get into this writing, yeah. creating at any level is narcissism to some extent. 
and it doesn't tend to make good people of us, right? We have to, most artists, I think, have to work if they want to be good people to incorporate that goodness part of themselves into the part that's standing here going, you know, I mean, if you want to be on a microphone anywhere, there's some about you that says, hey, I'm cool. I have something to say uh, that even people who know, who have no interest in my success can benefit from, right? It's like there's a degree of ego in there, right? And so I'm always trying to grapple with that. Um, but, uh, but when you get into that zone, for me anyway, the more I work, the more I'm going to produce. If I do it for two or three weeks, my brain gets to boiling and I won't be able to sleep. And uh, uh, I've never really chased it longer than that because it gets really unhealthy inside there. But, uh, but it feels good at the time. I mean, it's, it's a low level mania, I think. So. You've I'm written... sorry that my sentences are so long. I'm very sorry. I, I'm enjoying it. I, you, <laughs> I do want to get two more things in before we play your song. You wrote a novel called The Wolf in the White Van. Is that right? Wolf in White Van. I have Wolf in White Van. Right behind me, here's the Italian edition of it. Uh, it's called Il Lupo del Fugone Bianco. <laughs> and then I also have the French version. Let me just mutilate that one. Uh, Le Loup dans la Camion Blanc. <laughs> so it is. But yeah, that was the first one. The second one was called Universal Harvester. Did you try to write during COVID? Did you try to sit down and write another novel? Oh, I mean, I've been working on a novel for the past five or six years. So yeah, I've, I've been, it made it so much harder because I have two children. Um, so normally they go to school and I go to my office, right? Well, that it came to a grinding halt. And I'm still, I mean, literally, you can't see this, but on the floor now is the stuff I'm revising. I'm, I'm, I'm in home stretch on that book and I'm really excited. Oh, wow. Uh, and I'm working on it every day, but I'm not getting the kind of eight hour days I would get if I was going to the office. I, it's like, I, this is my home office, but there's two children out there. Right. And, uh, and also there's a video game with a magic, the gathering program on it here that, that, that can, can be very distracting. So. It's so funny the way you talk about they're out there. There's children out there. They are. They're right there. It's like a, <laughs> they're always right there. I know you, I know you love them. Uh, you were kind enough to send us another track. This one is called short song about the 10 freeway. Old, is that, song. old song. Is that pretty much self-explanatory? So, I mean, this is, I was talking about the, 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 how those old songs were about urgency, right? Just the urgency mm -hmm. of the writing. I mean, it's like one thing that I liked. And again, it's like, I was, a, at, by the time I recorded this, I'm studying English at Pitzer and I'm deep in theory. I'm thinking about what mm -hmm. is writing, all these kinds of things, you know, what, you know, what, uh, why does one write all these questions? You sort of stop asking yourself once it's your gig and you just do it. But I was like, I, I wanted a song to bear evidence of its own creation, right? I wanted you to be able to mm -hmm. hear how it felt to be writing it. Right. Okay. That is not really in literature. That's usually not going to be good, but it, 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 in song, it can get there. Right. So you can you can do something. I mean, obviously, in improvisational jazz, that's what it's about. It's like you do something and it's never been done before and it will never be done the same way again. But the people who are in that room get to hear it. And I had an idea of being able to do that in this sort of cross section of poetry and music that I was working. Um, I mean, the, the lyric is quite simple, but uh, but I feel like when it gets to the resolve, uh, it goes to this to this G, and for me that G was huge at the time. It's only like a minute and a half long. <laughs> so it is, John Darnell. Thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, it's a pleasure. I, it's 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 a it's a real honor uh, to be with you. You know, I I, I I can't say I grew up with you, but like watching uh, you do the ninety two election and stuff like that is like I I know your work. You put in really good work at the you know, and uh, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. That's so kind. Let's take a listen to short song about the 10 freeway. Evening came on like a big red wing And the dying sun
Thanks to John Darneal of Mountain Goats for those performances. And of course, to Patricia Lockwood for being our Get Lit With All Of It March author. So we're about to announce our April, tomorrow's April, can you believe it? We're about to announce our April book. I have to thank a few people because we have good manners around here from the New York Public Library. A big thank you to Tony Marks, Brian Bannon, Andrew Medlar. They are the folks who work to get the eBooks into your hands every month. Well, not your hands. Your screens from the green space shout out to jennifer cam ricardo and david they make this look beautiful each and every month and from team all of it the team that produces get lit megan ryan jordan loft and simon close they bring it to you all month long and they work really hard on these virtual events now to our april author the writer was a 2017 recipient of the Nobel Prize in Literature. You might know him from his seminal novels, The Remains of the Day, and Never Let Me Go. His latest novel was published in March, and it's already a New York Times bestseller. NPR has called it a masterpiece. We're going to be reading Clara and the Sun by Kazoa Ishiguru. The story follows Clara, an artificial friend waiting patiently in the shop to be purchased, all the while taking in information about the humans around her. Finally, Clara is selected by a teenager named Josie and taken home to live with her and her mother. It's there that Clara learns Josie is ill and that Josie's mother might have another purpose for Clara's role in the family. The Guardian calls Clara and the son brilliant and a masterpiece that explores what it means to be not quite human, drawing its power from the darkest shadows of the uncanny valley. New Yorkers, head to wnyc.org slash get lit to find out how to borrow an e-copy from the New York Public Library. And then mark your calendars for 6 p.m. It's different, our usual time is 7 p.m. But 6 p.m. on Monday, April 26th, this will be our virtual event with Kazuo Ishiguro. Until then, follow us on Instagram at all of it, WNYC. Happy reading, and I'll see you next time. Be safe.